Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the True Church of Jesus Christ with His Latter Day Saint. And in this edition, we're going to get into the universal mystical form of the Lord. But before we get into that, let's go to Matthew chapter. Oh, where are we at? Uh, Matthew 11, verse 25. On one occasion, Jesus spoke, "Father, Lord of heaven and earth, I offer you praise for what you've hidden from the learned and what, and the clever. Actually, you've just revealed to the merest children." Father, it's true, you've graciously willed it so. Everything has been given over to me by the Father. No one knows the Son but the Father. So that's, you know, you can say God's mystical re uh, relationship with his Son. And no one knows the Father but the Son, you see. And anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. So that's also enlightenment. Remember, that's the reason why we're <laughs> uh, following religion or following a religious life. Uh, the goal of life itself is also mingled within the hearts and minds of every individual, but it's not your dreams. Oh, that's, you know, that's big. God's not like, you know, indifferent to your goals or your endeavors or your heart and your mind. That's not the case because God is uh, you, you, but that you has to be reborn into God. <laughs> So it's not the aspirations we desire to in the world. Actually, the mission, remember, do not suppose that my mission on earth is to spread peace. My mission is not to spread peace, but to bring division. So this is the mystical self-realization. He who seeks only himself brings himself to ruin. That means the tonic of flesh. So if you entertain a body in your mind, and I have to do this, and I have to do that, well, remember, practice prayer, Matthew chapter 6, and self-surrender. Give your activities up to God, but also practice that matter is an illusion. Remember, or you could say, my body and this, whatever I'm seeing in time and space, isn't the absolute truth. That's another thing we could say instead of saying that matter is an illusion. If that sounds too complicated, well, just imagine this, right? When you uh, are out in the sun, and you know how little kids burn ants with a magnifying glass, well, that light goes through that magnifying glass, and it makes the light a little bit sharper, and then it burns the ant. Well, that's what this material creation's like. It's a beam of light, but we're at like the end point of going through the magnifying glass, so that's what is known by the veil as well. We have to cross through the veil, and then there's like this more light, you could say, but it's a dissipating light. So that's what it means that matters an illusion, that this uh, nature is not the total life, that there's something higher that we have to aspire to, and that's the kingdom of God. So it's all in Matthew chapter 6. But that's why this life is more like a, not like a, it is a testing ground, but more for observance. Everything has certain measure. So you have to measure why there's a certain amount of human beings on this planet Earth today. Also, God gave a certain measure of planets. Why is there so much in our galaxy? Spread apart a certain measure. And different sizes. All of those are meant for observances. So if people, again, caught up with different views, might want to disprove God or disprove teachings or whatever, uh, you don't have to disprove that. You know, don't go to that step of disproving God. What you got to do is disprove this creation first. <laughs> and uh, if you can't answer why there's that much planets in the galaxy and why they're that big, then you have no questioning God. You know what I mean? So there's different things that you have to judge in your mind in coming to the conclusions of truth. If you can't answer too much of these things, that's why this creation is best to be witnessed and to build up the observer. So that's what prayer is. And to notice that too, there's a certain measure of uh, light. So now we're hitting up that winter season and uh, it doesn't get bright. So the sunset until maybe 7.45, 8 o'clock. Now it's about 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon over here in Hamilton, Ontario. And soon, I mean, half hour from now, hour from now, it's going to be pitch black. So we're given a certain measure throughout these seasons, you see. And they can't be controlled by man. So man can't control the, the light, the measure that he receives throughout the day. The only thing he can manipulate 
is now that artificial light, so that lamppost, and it makes the society go 24 hours a day. And he pushes, you could say, by passion or economic advancement, a false sense of life as well that doesn't uh, tune in or observe, you could say, these phenomena of nature. But you can't escape it. It's just people don't realize it. And that's the problem because they're you know too much in the phone. Or let's just say the, the job. Now we're not geared towards uh, monitoring the time outside, but now we're just monitoring our own time and what we're allotted in our day. So that's why Matthew chapter 6 says, do not take thought and just observe this environment. And even, too, to not take thought of the time. So that's another thing just to observe these certain measures. <laughs> it's not that they're time because time changes, right? We're given a certain measure of that light. Oh, it was like what? Uh, August, right? So it gets like sunny at five quarter to quarter to six in the morning. Sun doesn't go down till about you know eight forty five. It's almost you know fourteen hours of daylight there. So we're getting certain measures of time as well. And certain things dictate certain potencies. So how one can perform as well. It's almost like uh, an apple. It, it really produces its potency at the end of its harvest. So observing these things in life and using that wisdom, you could find that parallel in Matthew chapter 6 as well. Because that's what he also tells us about the birds. Observe. See, this whole observing and building a measure of consciousness it's very important on the way and uh, before we get on the way here <laughs> with the universal form of the Lord remember all these measures just understand that you're in a galaxy and that universe too is bigger than this galaxy that's uh, now we're going to get into the Bhagavad Gita and the Lord has a not only this cosmic and universal manifestation but his own spiritual body and uh, mystical form, you could say. And that was revealed to Arjuna. But before we get into that, we get to two Nephi. So this is from the Book of Mormon. But behold, so this is two Nephi chapter 17. In the last days, so this is, uh, I believe, we're in these last days, or in the days of the Gentiles, as it's called. Yea, behold, all the nations of the Gentiles and also the Jews, both those who shall come upon the land and those who shall be upon the other lands, yea, even upon the lands of the earth, behold, they will be drunken with iniquity and all manner of abominations. And when that day shall come, they shall be visited by the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and with great noise and with storm, with tempest and with flame of devouring fire. And all the nations that fight against Zion and that distress her shall be as a dream of a night vision. Yea, it shall be unto them as even unto a hungry man which dreameth. And behold, he eateth, but he awaketh, and his soul is empty. <laughs> so it's like in a dream, right? And you have a nice bit of turkey. Oh yeah, but then you wake up and where's that turkey? Or it's like unto a thirsty man that has a dream. And behold, he drinks, but he awakes, and he, he is still faint. And his soul has an appetite. Yea, even so shall it be with the multitudes, that all the nations shall fight against Mount Zion. So that's the thing, being with God or being with this world. If you fight against God, basically, what that parable is saying is you'll be left empty. And that's what this life more is. You'll be left in this empty life. Even though it feels like a dream, you'll be left empty in it if you fight against the Lord. Verse 4. For behold, all ye that doeth iniquity... Stay yourselves and wonder, for ye shall cry out and cry, yea, shall be drunken, but not with wine, ye shall stagger, but not with strong drink. So what that means is, because the people that don't believe and repent, they're going to be drunken with their uh, miseries, their woes. And when this great day comes upon them, they're going to be shaken about because of their disbelief. Verse 5, for behold, the Lord hath poured out upon the spirit of the deep sleep for behold you have closed your eyes and you have rejected the prophets and your rulers and the seers he hath covered because of your iniquities and it shall come to pass that the lord god shall bring forth unto you the words of a book 
and they shall be the words of them with which have slumbered. And behold, the book shall be sealed, and in the book shall be a revelation from God, from the beginning of the world to the ending thereof. Therefore, because of the things which were sealed up, the things which were sealed shall not be delivered in the day of the wickedness and abominations of the people. Therefore, the book shall be kept from them. Now, I believe these books that they're talking about, is more, it could be the Gnostic literature, because that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s. Or it could be just these uh, Book of Nephi, these plates. See, as, as uh, the people... See, the whole history of the Book of Mormon was the prophet Jeremiah gave the people at the time there in Jerusalem a warning from God that God was going to destroy Jerusalem. And Nephi and his father believed, and they took the records of the Jews, so like the uh, books of Moses and the patriarchs, Lehi and Nephi, so the Book of Mormon and their ancestral generation, stole, you could say, the records from the people that didn't believe. So you could say like the fake Jews <laughs> who uh, were, you know, worshiping idols and brought the wrath of God upon them. So that's these books were kept hidden. So this whole verse here is about hidden books that are coming to pass because we're in the latter days. So like the Gnostic literature, all the books from the Nag Hammadi are coming about and they were kept away because of people sinning, being, being evil. And uh, this is what the Book of Mormon is being a great light upon us in these days so it already says that some of these scriptures are going to be revealed in the last days especially the books about God verse 9 but the book shall be delivered unto a man and he shall deliver the words of the book which are the words of those who have slumbered in the dust and he shall deliver these words unto another but the words of which were sealed he shall not deliver neither shall he deliver the book for the book shall be sealed by the power of God and the revelation which was sealed shall be kept in the book until the own due time of the Lord, that they may come forth. For behold, they reveal all things from the foundation of the world unto the end thereof. So I believe that is the Gnostic literature that they found in 1990, uh, sorry, 1941 there, or in the 40s. Somewhere around the 40s there in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they have the Nag Hammadi Library that really details, you could say, the Pista Sophia mystery. So maybe these hidden scrolls were, I, maybe the resurrection knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because at the day's choosing, or the Lord's choosing, he brought out these books. So that's an, another thing too with the resurrection knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the Bible, especially in John, right at the end there, he says, Oh, we marvel at the work of the Master and what he's accomplished, and not all the things he's done can appear in this book, quote unquote. So they left out a lot of his work, and it was in the Lord's due time, as you see in these scriptures being revealed in the Book of Mormon. Uh, so maybe by the Lord's plan, these Dead Sea Scrolls were sealed up until these coming days, or even the Book of Mormon itself was released to Joseph Smith at around its due time. So the Lord does have his own mysterious workings and how he plants his books here in time and space. Uh, verse 11, And the day cometh, that the words of the book which were sealed shall be reaped, or so, uh, sorry, shall be read upon the housetops, and they shall be read by the power of Christ. So for people like me that have walked away and received a certain measure of the Holy Spirit, that's what it's talking about here. They're being read by the power of Christ. So there's other people in other YouTube channels that have inspiration as well too. This is the time where the Christ and its spirit is being outpoured to man. And all things shall be revealed unto the children of men, which ever have been among the children of men, and which were ever will be until the end of the earth. So that's why this uh, Nag Hammadi literature, it's not anything new actually. What it is is the Vedas. So it's the mysteries of how death made the human body out of clay. That's what the Vedas is. And that is what the Gnostics revealed as well. So those literatures, even though they span from ones from ancient India, <laughs> and then you get the master with the with the uh, coming down and working with the Hebrews and the Greeks and all. <clears throat> Either way, uh, the knowledge of God is preached uh, universally. 
so the Indians knew that again this creation there was uh, in the shadows the shadows created the principle of the human body and basically the infinity of God God touched you could say the death principle of the nothingness or the non-existence with his infinity you see and that infinity is latent or sleeping within well it's not like God is sleeping we are asleep to this one consciousness and that's what this information is being revealed in the final days so some of the origins of creation are being revealed and that's the Gnostic literature and that's been coming out recently and well verse 12 here therefore at the day when the book shall be delivered unto the a man who I have spoken the book shall be hid from the eyes of the world that the eyes of none shall behold it save it be that there witness shall behold it by the power of God beside him to whom the book shall be delivered and they shall testify to the truth of the book and the things therein so I'm not too sure about these other literatures as well because God does have a mass amount of work anyways uh, either way we'll get into the Bhagavad Gita and all these books that are already here you see the Bhagavad Gita has been around for a long time the Vedas or I should say the Upanishads that explained what the death principle is so the Gnostic teachings of how the Elohim or the spirit beings fashioned man out of the non-existence and then God breathed the life principle into him you could say and that life principle is the immortal soul but it's enclosed in a tonic of flesh and basically the nature illusion basically <laughs> All these things are, uh, I've extracted the secrets and it made it easy to talk about. But it takes a tremendous amount of study and it's going to have to open you up into prayer as well too. So you have to make God contact in order for these scriptures to make sense. So that's like the mystery of this creation, right? How the spirit beings fashion man in the chaos of the non-existence. So he made the mortal body. It, it, it wasn't alive. It, it couldn't spring up and walk around. That's the mystery of the Pista Sophia now, of how the Lord God in the second chapter of Genesis breathed his breath into Adam and sp sprang him up from the dust of the earth. That's also the mystery of how infinity is also in this uh, mortal creation or in the chaos. But either way, it's how something can come from nothing. So that's the mysteries of the Lord. But we're going to go to the universal form. And this is now outside of the chaos. So outside of this material creation. No one's ever seen. It's going to explain in this chapter how no one's ever seen the universal form of the Lord with their own two eyes. <laughs> so don't worry if you haven't seen God or his universal form. Either way. We'll continue on here with uh, chapter 11. And Arjuna says, By hearing your instructions, you have kindly given me about these most confidential spiritual subjects. My illusion has now been dispelled. O Lotus-Eyed One, I have heard from you in detail about the appearances and disappearances of every living entity and have re realized your inexhaustible glories. O greatest of all personalities, O supreme form, Though I see you here before me in your actual position, as you have described yourself, I wish to see how you have entered into this cosmic manifestation, and I want to see that form of yours. If you think that I am able to behold your cosmic form, O oh my Lord, O oh my Master of mystic power, then kindly show me that unlimited universal self. So God's, you know, devoted... Uh, devotee Arjuna he's asking a big thing he's asking to see like the universal form of God in his spiritual likeness so that's beyond uh, you know the, the mortal creation that's beyond mortal eyes he's asking something very spectacular actually and uh, well here it is the, the supreme personality of God had said oh my dear Arjuna son of Partha See now my opulence, hundreds of thousands of very divine and multicolored forms. And what I wanted to say here was, let's talk about, like to say, the form of Jesus Christ. 
So let's understand this body that we have, okay? The body that we have is generated, remember, from the death principle. But it doesn't have what's included in our knowledge is that spiritual breath, okay? So we're not aware of the one consciousness. <laughs> we're not aware of God as soon as we're in this creation. But the uh, tonic of flesh, or what is called the human being, the mortal, has the capacity to... So John chapter 10, the doorway is through Jesus Christ, the word of God. And if he believes in the word and follows the way, then the door will be open to him for his immortal soul to be revealed. And God's realm, you could say, the spiritual kingdom of God. In the book 2 of Ezra, there's two kingdoms. So this mortal creation, what you see with your eyes, and then there's a spiritual kingdom, okay? And the light of its world is not like the sun here. So that's also a very big description. Now, the bodies in this spiritual world do not accept birth and death because eternity is there. Immortality, incorruptibility. So there's no age. Nothing can age there because nothing can corrupt or deteriorate or oxidize. That's another thing as well, too. Because the dominion of matter as it says that God gave dominion over these elements, air, earth, fire, and water, what the creation is made of. And they do not affect Adam when he was in the garden. That's a huge mystery in the book 1 and 2 in Adam and Eve. When he fell away from the light body, all of a sudden he had a body of darkness. And his mind grew dark. So it grew into the seed of the mortal body. So that's the mystery of the Gnosis teaching of how that death body grew <laughs> without the life principle of God because Adam was away from God now as it revealed in the scripture he fell away from the kingdom of God he fell away from the spirit and that spirit doesn't accept you could say uh, mortal law so it won't accept like the laws of disease there's no such thing as disease in the kingdom of God there's nothing that can be corrupted in the kingdom of God so that might be a little bit difficult to understand because of this fall that we're all in, it's hard to see something that cannot be corrupted in time and space. But these things can be revealed to you within your own individual consciousness, because the idea is that your consciousness, what is not seen in time and space, the truth of your being is God, or at least what they say is you're the spark. And it has the potential, just like the drop of rain, to go back into the river. <laughs> so that's all the human being has the potential of his thoughts feelings and actions have the potential to go back to godhead and be revealed its immortality if it follows the way and the body of the, of the lord doesn't accept the material creation so when jesus christ was born yes he was born as a baby you see he wasn't born as a straight man but he was immaculately conceived. He was not made with hands of fornication, you could say. So it didn't take Mary and Joseph to uh, do anything to conceive of Jesus Christ. And not only that, but the pregnancy, it's a mystery of creation. This creation was delivered with no hands. As you can see, the non-existence created something. <laughs> So that's the Immaculate Conception. He also was delivered with no hands. It's the mysteries of creation. And right out of the womb, he was able to speak. So he did not accept a birth. And when mortals accept the birth, the brain is obviously underdeveloped to perform speech. It has to grow like a seed in time and space and develop these organs and functions. Not the body of God, not Jesus Christ, not the consciousness of God. The consciousness of God doesn't affect mortal creation. So he could speak right away. And he spoke in the scriptures that he has to get crucified. He already spoke of his crucifixion while he was a baby. And I'm trying to explain to you, like, babies obviously cannot speak. That's why God is different. He comes from the spiritual kingdom that does not have or possess any material or mortal qualities so there is not any birth and death that takes place in the kingdom of God 
Uh, there's not any corruption of any kind. So deterioration, age, disease, none of that takes place in the activity and function of the body of God, so of the body of Jesus Christ, and his consciousness. That's why he's known as the sinless lamb. He did not accept the material birth and death, and his body showed forth that because he was able to speak. So that's what it is for us. The significance of God consciousness is now that we're under first this material law of nature, disease, corruption. That's what Brother Paul says, being under the law of death, the body, mortality. And if you believe and have faith in Christ and spirit, we're lifted out from under the laws of mortality and into the grace and spirit of God. So you could say that dove that descended upon him. And that dove performed the crucifixion and the resurrection. So it basically defied death because Christ lived. <laughs> and not only that, but the piercings on the cross, his body also was healed all by the power and spirit of God within us. That has to be realized. So we have to come out from under the law and into the grace of God. And that's what being involved in the similitude of Christ means. That we're no longer under the material or mortal contamination ourselves because God and his son defeated the mortal contamination of birth and death already on the cross. So that's what original sin is all about, you could say. If one is born in a body, they're just born in mortality and birth and death. And <clears throat> the, your original self is spirit that does not accept these positions. So that's why the Bhagavad Gita, when it talks about positions, that's what it actually means, is that the spirit soul who does not, so the conditioned consciousness, the people that don't know the truth, they accept the material modes of nature because they don't know where it came from. That's man's fallen state. And not only do they accept the body as their own, they accept this creation as all that there is as well. So they accept birth. And what comes with that? Accepting your body as real and accepting this creation as real? Death. <laughs> Just simply put. Because this is the creation of death. As you can see, these seasons, there's a winter that produces a lot of death. <laughs> <clears throat> These are all the signs and measures. Man is allotted a certain time of death and life and also a material rebirth. But we're not looking for a material rebirth. That's not what it means by being reborn in the spirit. Oh no, you're going to be reborn in the spirit, spirit. You're going to have that one consciousness contact where all matter is condensed into a small vibration. And there's only one consciousness. And you're going to get into that Mr. Musashi moment. Emptiness, formless, the nothingness and the void. <laughs> that is why you follow God. That's the result of John chapter 10 going through the door. And it's important to understand the bodies of God. Because why we get into God consciousness is to overcome our mortal conditions. So only by prayer... See, not by might, not by your thoughts. You cannot overcome mortality by doing actions in this world. Who by taking thought can gain their immortality or the kingdom of God? Or overcome cancer or overcome disease or overcome poverty. These are all mortal conditions. And only the spirit of God overcame mortal conditions so that's another significance of why we get into prayer and god contact because under him that's why the bhagavad Gita says we take shelter prayer is like taking shelter it's like if you're homeless and poor you go to the homeless shelter <laughs> well in time and space we are taking shelter within ourselves because the kingdom of god is within us and all the ones that followed the way, see, 
we tread along everybody else that's taken shelter under God throughout time and space as well. Because there's only one consciousness. And you can draw from other people's inspiration upon the way. You don't have to separate yourself from others because there's only one consciousness. And the other people upon the path have taken shelter underneath the Lord and will be revealed the actual mystical one consciousness. That's the whole point of following the way is to have that enlightenment. And it's a true mystical experience as well. But the body of God is different. See, when you see Jesus Christ, he does he's not a mortal. That's why he's not a man. Is because he did not accept these positions of birth. So that's a huge one. And then there's a universal form of the Lord. So there's many forms. As, as the Lord is saying here, there's many, many forms of him. And the reason why the Bhagavad Gita was so significant is because in uh, for my life, right? I liked uh, mythology when I was in high school. So in like grade 10, you know, I was just a little idiot. And you hear about Greek mythology like Zeus and all Aphrodite and Hades and yada, 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 yada. And the Bhagavad Gita is the same thing. Indra and, and, she, and Shiva and whatever, right? It doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say is the demigods all worship. They all worship God. That was the secret hidden mystery I found in the Indian knowledge. Because the Indians really mastered consciousness and life. The Greeks didn't. The Greeks did not worship God. They didn't have a God. So in Acts 17, Brother Paul goes into Athens and he sees that. In Athens, there's a statue that says, to an unknown God. See, they knew kind of that there was just one principle. They heard it from Egypt because Plato went down there. But they didn't find it. Not like the Orientals did with Lao Tzu. They couldn't find their immortality. But the Indians did. And they all knew about the supreme person. There's only one consciousness and the absolute truth. So the supreme person revealed itself. <laughs> and the supreme person is worshipped by everybody. So the demigods perform elaborate, ridiculous, opulent uh, ceremonies and worship and paraphernalia just to see one of these forms of God. So they devise worship, ceremony, and ritual just to try to catch a glimpse of one of the Lord's forms. See, the mortals don't know anything about God at all. <laughs> and they don't know the goal. The whole goal of worshiping God is to catch a glimpse of God, to catch God consciousness. See, the demigods know this, but they do like, <laughs> they do parades, gold stat, they, they do ridiculous things. That's what it says in the literature there. Just to try to get a glimpse of God. And God doesn't reveal himself to the pompous demigods with their paraphernalia and pompous worship. God reveals himself to the brokenhearted and the meek just searching for love. That's who God reveals himself to. <laughs> to the guy that's just downtrodden. But he doesn't know that God's with him, you see. That's another thing they're not taught. God is with the persecuted and the ones that are oppressed. And why does he do that? Well, it's because there's no one else there to support people. And that's why God always, there's the one consciousness who looks out for its sheep. But the sheep don't know that they're getting looked out for sometimes because they might not have faith in God anyways. But the idea here is in prayer is to catch a glimpse of God. And God, you're just praying. That's why you do this. So if you're not taught why you're praying in Matthew chapter 6, it's to catch a glimpse of God. This is the whole point of the ministry. To seek the kingdom of God. The one consciousness. And hopefully you might get, that's why Arjuna was wise enough. He didn't ask God for a house or a girlfriend. He asked him to see his, like, infinite form. Not, not a form, not like a body. See, the demigods want to see 
the personality of Godhead and his four-armed form. Like he has he has a form with four arms. And that apparently is the most auspicious form of the Lord. <laughs> so the demigods, they perform some kind of worship with rituals, paraphernalia, pompous celebration and elaborate ceremonies just to try to see the four-armed lotus one with his club, conch shell, list, lotus flower, and disc. They just try to try, and they can't. He doesn't. God doesn't just do. He doesn't just appear to people because oh, look at look at all this stuff he does, or they do. That's the mystery too about fruitive actions. That's the mystery behind taking no thought. You can't produce any action that's going to make you catch a glimpse of God. Are you kidding me? What are you going to do? Give money to charity, and all of a sudden God's going to appear to you? Are you nuts? There's masters of charity in the Bhagavad Gita. And they can't, God himself says, you can't just provoke me by being a master of charity. <laughs> I, I, God can't be influenced by any man. That's the whole point as well. You can't do nothing. <laughs> that's the mystery. Take no thought. Oh, that's big mystery. What are you going to do? That's, a, that's, that, that's the whole idea of the teaching is to try to catch a glimpse of God, uh, maybe one of his forms, <laughs> if you're uneducated about what form. And that's the whole thing that now with the Christ teaching is just uh, seek the kingdom of God, seek me, seek only me, the spirit of Jesus Christ. So 2 Corinthians uh, 13 verse 5. And just study, there's only one consciousness. You don't have to be a nerd like me and study the many forms of the Lord, you see? So there's many wonderful things which no one has ever seen or heard before because of these many forms. O Arjuna, whenever you wish to see me, behold, at once in this body of mine, this universal form can show you whatever you know, desire to see, and whatever you may want to see in the future. Everything moving and non-moving is here completely in one place. <laughs> so the supreme person of God the absolute truth shows him the universe is all in one place. And that's also in Bhagavad Gita, Canto 10. So when the Supreme Lord is a, is a child, he basically uh, is being breastfed by his mother. And he opens his mouth and the mystical opulence, the sublime power of God, as soon as he opens his mouth, she looks into the, the entire universe is inside his mouth <laughs> that was the mystical power and opulence of god as a child and jesus christ i was wondering i'm like oh man you know I, I, it, does jesus christ have this kind of mystical power oh whoa. in the infancy of jesus christ in that scripture he's already talking he's already healing the leopards or the lepers, the lepers, the leopards. <laughs> He's already healing the sick. Goes into Egypt, shakes the idols in the entire city as a baby. He's doing the same transcendental opulences. And at the same time, he's picking his ministry. So he got slapped by Satan when si what, 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 Judas, sorry, even when he was a kid. It says in the scripture there, him and Judas were together as children, and Judas slapped Jesus. See, those are the mystical stories that Satan was already provoking Jesus at that time. No one will ever notice if they don't read the scriptures. But the infancy of Christ is all mystical. That's why he didn't accept the birth and a death. You don't ever know that either if you don't read the scriptures. So that's why when he says everything is here completely in one place, it's because God, had, God is God. And the, the, this whole Western society has lost the God part of it, where God is su supreme, infinite, and sublime, opening his mouth and showing you the universe. That's unheard of. But that's what we see in scriptures, because these things were, are the revealed scriptures, you could say. They're kept away from people, because they don't have faith that Lord Sri Krishna, the supreme person as a baby, can do these things. Or Jesus Christ, the infancy there in the scriptures. He can do these things. So here's another uh, verse 8. 
but you cannot see me with your present eyes. So that's another thing too with getting into prayer. We cannot see the spirit of God with our present eyes. Therefore, I give you divine eyes. Behold my mystic opulence. <laughs> so that's what we're hoping for, is his divine eyes. So, O King, having spoken thus, the Supreme Lord of all mystic power, the personality of Godhead, displayed his universal form to Arjuna. Arjuna saw in that universal form unlimited mouths, unlimited eyes, unlimited wonderful visions. The form was decorated with many celestial ornaments and bore many divine upraised weapons. He wore celestial garments and garments, garlands, sorry, and many divine scents were smeared over his body. All was wondrous, brilliant, unlimited, all expanding. If hundreds of thousands of suns were to rise at once in the sky, their radiance might resemble a small effulgence that was emanating from the supreme personality of Godhead in his universal form. So his universal form was brighter than like a hundred thousand suns. <laughs> the effulgence of the Lord. At that time, Arjuna can see in the universal form of the Lord the unlimited expansions of the universe, situated in one place, all through divided into many thousands of thousands of forms. Then bewildered and astonished, his hair standing on end, Arjuna bowed his head to offer respect and with folded hands began to pray to the Supreme Lord. Arjuna said, My dear Lord Krishna, I see assembled in your body all the demigods and various other living uh, various other living entities. I see Brahma sitting on the lotus flower, as well as Lord Shiva, and all the other sages and divine serpents, all within your universal form. O oh, Lord of the universe, O oh, universal form, I see your body in many, many arms, bellies, mouths, and eyes, expanded everywhere, without limit. I see in you no end, no middle, and no beginning. Your form is difficult to see because of its glaring effulgence. It's so brilliant, spreading on all sides like blazing fire or the immeasurable radiance of the sun. Yet I see this glowing form everywhere, adorned with various crowns, clubs, and discs. You are the supreme primordial objective. You are the ultimate resting place of all the universe. You are the inexhaustible and you are the oldest. You are the maintainer of the eternal religion, the supreme personality of Godhead. And this is my personal opinion. <laughs> yeah, of course, after seeing the universal form of the Lord. You are without origin, middle, or end. Your glory is unlimited. You have numberless arms. The sun and moon are your eyes. I see you with the blazing fire coming forth from your mouth, burning this entire universe by your own radiance. Although you are one, you spread throughout the sky and the planets and all space between. O oh, great one, seeing this wondrous and terrible form, all planetary systems are perturbed. All the hosts of the demigods are surrendered before you and entering into you, some of them very much afraid and offering prayers with folded hands. Hosts of great sages and perfected beings crying, All peace and praises be unto ye are praying to you by singing the Vedic hymns. All the various manifestations of the Lord and all of his satyas, sadyas, and vasedas, all of his, <laughs> basically like every form you can imagine here, he's, he's trying to say like the grandfathers of creation, the grandfathers of time, all these are perfected in you. The demigods are beholding you in this wonder. O oh, almighty armed one, all the planets with their demigods are disturbed at seeing your great form with its many faces eyes arms thighs legs and bellies and your many terrible teeth and they're very disturbed and so am i oh all pervading vishnu seeing you with your many radiant colors touching the sky your gaping mouths and your great glowing eyes my mind is perturbed by fear I can no longer maintain my steadiness or equilibrium of mind. <laughs> uh, 
O Lord of Lords, O refuge of the worlds, please be gracious to me. I cannot keep my balance seeing thus your blazing death-like faces. And awful teeth in all directions, I am so bewildered by your terrible form. All the sons of, uh, di sorry, all the sons along with their allied kings, and Bhishma, Drona, and Karna, and our other chief soldiers also are rushing into your fearful mouths. And some I see trapped with heads, smashed in between your teeth in the universal form. As many waves of the rivers flow into the ocean, so do all these great warriors enter your blazing mouths. I see all people rushing full speed into your mouths as moths dash into the destruction of a blazing fire. O oh, Supreme Lord, I see you devouring all people from all sides <laughs> with your flaming mouths, covering all the universe with your effulgence. You are the manifester and with terrible scorching rays. <laughs> o oh, Lord of Lords, so fierce of form, please tell me who you are. I offer my respect to you. Please be gracious to me. You're my primeval Lord. I want to know about you, for I do not know what your mission is. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Time I am, the great destroyer of worlds, and I have come here to destroy all people. With the exception of you, the Pandavas, all the soldiers here on both sides will be slain. Therefore get up, prepare to fight, and win with glory. Conquer your enemies and enjoy a flourishing kingdom. They're ready to be put to death by my arrangement, and you, O son of Pritha, can be but an instrument to me in the fight. Now all the rest of them and the other great warriors have already been destroyed by me. Therefore kill them, and do not be disturbed. Simply fight, and you will vanquish your enemies in battle. Now the great king, after hearing these words from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the trembling Arjuna offered respects with folded hands again and again. He fearfully spoke to Lord Krishna in a faltering voice as follows. Arjuna says, O master of the senses, the world becomes joyful upon hearing your name, and thus everyone becomes attached to you. Although the perfected beings offer you their respectful homage, the demons are afraid, and they flee from here. All, with this, might, all this is righteously done in your sight. O oh, great one, greater than the Brahma, you're the original creator. Why then would they not offer their respect to you? O oh, unlimited one, God of gods, refuge of the universe. You are the invincible source, the cause of all causes, transcendental to this material manifestation. You're the original supreme personality of Godhead, the oldest, the ultimate sanctuary of this unmanifest cosmic world. You are the knower of everything, and you are all that is knowable. You're the supreme refuge, above the material modes. O oh, limited form, this whole cosmic manifestation is pervaded by you. You are the air. You are the supreme controller. You are fire, you are water, and you are the moon. You are Brahma, the first living creature. And you're the great grandfather. I therefore offer my respect unto you a thousand times over again and again. Respect to you from the front and from behind and from all sides, O oh, unbounded power. You are the master of limitless night. You are the all-pervading and thus you are everything. Thinking, thinking of you as my friend, I have rashly addressed you, O oh, 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 Krishna. Please, O oh, my friend, not knowing your glories, please forgive whatever, whatever I may have done in madness or in love. I have dishonored you many times, jesting as we were relaxed, lay on the same bed or sat or ate together sometimes alone and sometimes in front of many friends. Oh, infallible one, please excuse me for all those offenses. See, after, after, Krishna, after Krishna revealed Arjuna, his God form, Arjuna now is like dropping on his knees and saying, oh my God, please forgive me for everything I've ever done. <laughs> You're the father of this complete cosmic manifestation of the moving and the non-moving. You're its worshipful chief the Supreme Spiritual Master. No one is equal to you, nor can anyone be equal equal or one with you. How then could there be anyone greater than you within these three worlds, O Lord of immeasurable power? You are the Supreme Lord to be worshipped by every living being. Thus I fall down and offer you my respectful obeisances and ask you for mercy. As a father tolerates his impudence of his son, 
a friend the impudence of a friend, or a husband the familiarity to his wife, please tolerate the wrongs I may have done to you. After seeing this universal form, which I have never seen before, I am gladdened, but at the same time my mind is perturbed with fear. Therefore, please bestow your grace upon me, and reveal again your form as personality of Godhead, O Lord of Lords, O abode of the universe. O universal form, O thousand-armed Lord, I wish to see you in your four-armed form, with helmet head, and with club, wheel, conch, and lotus flower in your hands. I long to see you in that form. And the Supreme Personality of Godhead says, My dear Arjuna, happily have I shown you by my internal potency this supreme universal form within the material world. But no one before you has ever seen this primal form, unlimited and full of glaring effulgence. So no one's ever seen that form with the thousand unlimited mouths, unlimited, unli uh, just the unlimited form of the Lord. So the Supreme Personality of Godhead says, O oh, best of Kuru warriors, no one before you has ever seen this universal form of mine. For neither by studying the Vedas, nor by performing sacrifices, nor by charity. See, this is what I'm trying to say here too. You can't see the Lord in any other way by following the way. He's trying to say that here too. You can't see me by performing sacrifices, nor by charity, nor by good deeds, so pious activities, or by severe sacrifices called penances. Uh, this, this form cannot be seen in the material world. So you've been perturbed and bewildered by seeing this horrible feature of mine. Now let it be finished, my devotee. Be free again from all disturbances. With a peaceful mind, you can now see the form you desire. So the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, having spoken to Arjuna, displayed his real four-armed form, and at last showed his two-armed form, thus encouraging the fearful Arjuna. When Arjuna thus saw Krishna in his original form, he said, oh, O Krishna, seeing this human-like form so very beautiful, I am now composed in my mind, and I am restored to my original nature. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, My dear Arjuna, this form of mind you are now seeing is very difficult to behold. Even the demigods are ever seeking the opportunity to see this form, which is so very dear. <clears throat> so that's what I mean before, but how the scripture was explaining that the demigods desperately wanted to see the form of the Lord. So verse 52 of the Bhagavad Gita there, he says that the forms are very difficult to behold. Even the demigods <laughs> are seeking an opportunity to see these forms. So his two-armed form, his four-armed form, and you can say like the universal form. The Lord has unlimited forms, as he was saying before. But these forms especially, so Krishna's like two-armed form, where he just looks like a normal human being, but he's blue. That form uh, they wanted to see. Also, where he has four arms, and he's carrying the weapon. So he's got the disc, club, uh, conch shell, and a lotus flower. That's another form they were trying to pray for. That's what the books explain, that everyone worships God, and they wanted to really see his forms, and they were so impossible to actually see and obtain. So that's why God consciousness, God contact, was extremely difficult. Jesus Christ pointed out the way as well. So the form you're seeing with your transcendental eyes cannot be understood by simply studying just scripture, the Vedas, nor by undergoing se uh, severe uh, piouses or penances, nor by charity, nor by worship. It is not by these means that one can see me as I am. My dear Arjuna, only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am standing before you and thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. I believe, oh, here you got one more. So this is verse 55. My dear Arjuna, he who engages in my pure devotional service, free from the contaminations of fruitive activities and mental speculation, he who works for me, 
who makes me the supreme goal of his life and who is friendly to every living being, he certainly comes to me. That's the end of the chapter there. So that's the trick to seeing God is devoting your activities. <laughs> and that you can say too is Matthew chapter 6 as well. So I hope that's been helpful. And the worship of the Lord is try to, you know, try to catch a glimpse of God. That's obtaining the one consciousness. But it's going to take a long time. It's a principle we have to follow, right? So let's just say if you're zealous about training. You want to look like Schwarzenegger. Well, there's a way to do it. There's a way to do it clean, too, without drugs. So, in God, we can't do the Joe Rogan experience. Take a whole bunch of mushrooms and LSD, and maybe that'll work. No, nope. we got to go to the gym in our own minds. So, Matthew chapter 6, and take no thought. And then God will be revealed to you. Just like if you go to the gym every day and apply those principles, you don't have to take steroids. You will, over time achieve the same results it's just there's a way to do things correctly and righteously so that's matthew chapter 6 again seek the kingdom of god his righteousness over you his kinship over you and all these things will be added and what we're doing here is trying to catch one of the forms of the lord <laughs> uh i'm going to read another chapter here too about devotional service but this video is getting a little bit long and i'll cut it short I'll make another one. Thank you guys for tuning in. Till next time, take care.